The views and opinions of the guests do not necessarily reflect those of Millennials' Choice. Viewer discretion is advised. A lot of people were upset and pissed off because the show presented you as uh, somebody that was uh, a John, Gotti, John Gotti's trusted associate. Yes. I'm not the producer. I'm not the director. Like I said, they put associate. They should have said Gotti's friend. There was an incident that happened in a club one night, and then I got into a fist fight. After that fight, John named me Rocky. People say that's not true, that's a lie. There were people there. The little genre of those men are throwing dots, but 196 countries around the world loved Andrea Giovino, loved her. You make a mistake, you get walked into a room by your best friend, you don't walk out again. When you have revenge in your heart, you might as well dig two graves, one for you, one for them. The minute I went into the mafia, I always felt that sooner or later I'm gonna get killed or go to prison for the rest of my life. We're back in the studio. Welcome to another episode of the Millennials Choice Show, guys. Thanks for watching. Here with my brother from the same mother. What's going on, my man? What's going on? And listen, I always say we got a special guest in the house, but we really got a special guest in the house. It's a first time for the Millennials Choice Show. We have a female person ready to share her, her story. And you guys heard of her for sure on Get Gaudy. And she's been making a lot of noise all over YouTube. She's gotten the attention of some really big names. We're going to address a lot of stuff on today's interview. This is an exclusive. We want to welcome to the show, Andrea Giovino. Andrea, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me on. It's our pleasure. Thanks for doing this for us. Guys, connect with us on our Discord. Hit that like button, subscribe, and let's jump right into it. Andrea, please tell us a bit about your story, your upbringing, your childhood, what it was like growing up, where you grew up, and how did you get introduced to the mafia? I grew up in an area in Brooklyn where in that particular area, a lot of Italians, a lot of immigrants came over from Italy. Um, so I came from a big Italian family. My mother was one of 16. So a lot of her family lived over in Ozone Park, it was called in Brooklyn. And with that, with being immigrants and all, my dad didn't believe in education. So I only have a seventh grade education. We weren't educated. So basically the, the kids in the neighborhood, everybody was kind of like me. They didn't go to school and there was a lot of criminals in the area. So growing up like that, basically my dad felt like when you go to school, you're going to learn bad things. So what I learned was to stay home and take care of the younger, because I'm one of 10. I'm one of 10 children. Oh, wow. And wow. so learn how to cook, clean, and basically cater to the husband, cater to the man. That's basically what our job was, to be a good homemaker. And my dad used to say to, to get to a man is to get to his stomach to make him eat well. <laughs> so if you make him eat well and you're a good cook, you'll have a good marriage, which is, we all know is not true. <laughs> so basically my mom, because we were poor for extra money, she was running card games in the basement of our home for a mob guy back then for tr Crazy Joe Gallo, which, you know, she knew people in the neighborhood and they said, okay, for Dolly, her name was Dolly to make extra money you know, would you throw some card games? So all the men would come over these, um, you know, with the suits and the pinky ring and the fedora hat, they would come over to the house while my dad would be going to work, which was a truck driver. But of course that didn't, that wasn't enough money to feed 10 children. So she did this on the side. And that was my first vision and first view of these types of men and this type of personality. So now you have my dad, which is coming home, work clothes, very tired, um, not polished at all, just your regular blue collar guy. And then you have these men coming in 
with the beautiful suits, very polished, the jewelry, the beautiful, shiny cars. So I think that at a very young age, I can say, because feeling the impact of being poor, um, I, I think that took a toll on me as far as feeling a lot of shame. I, you know, when I did go to school, maybe like the second, third, fourth, fifth grade, I wore a lot of shame. So I was a very angry kid because I was very poor. And I think that my vision of them was, I want to have nice things. I want to be with somebody like that. I don't want to have a hard life like my mom. So that vision stuck in my head. So as I had gotten older, maybe in my teens now, um, I started going out. I was like 15, 16 years old. And at that time to drink, you'd have to be 18. To get in a club, you'd have to be 18. But I was 16 and a friend of mine got me in the club. I never drank. I was never really one that was into drinking and drugs because my father instilled in all of us that, um, if you drink and do drugs, you're out of your element and then a man could take advantage of you. Mm. So you always have to have your senses. So that stuck in my head and that kind of put like some type of fear in me, which I still don't drink. I've never got drunk in my life. So anyway, um, with that, um, my first impression now at 16, I met um, a guy he was around a lot of these street guys. His name was Robert, Robert Scarpacci. They owned Scarpacci Funeral Home in Brooklyn. And through him, I met my first husband, which was Toby Perfetto. Now, these were all street guys. They weren't made guys, but they were guys in the streets. They knew people and stuff like that. So that's how I started getting involved with these types of men. When this was all happening, was your mom for it or did she know about it? And how about your dad? Because I want to also know, did your dad, so, like, was he in support of the card games as well? Or was it kind of a house well, divided? The, the card games, my dad didn't know what she was doing during the day because he was working a lot of hours, 15, 16 hours sometimes. I really didn't know my dad that much because he always worked. He was always a hard worker. Hmm. My mom was arrested actually for doing this because back then it was illegal but the judge threw it out because she went into court with all the kids and it was a lot of drama and the judge just was like that's it it's dismissed but yeah my dad found out and i guess you know they had their own issues to be perfectly honest like they were really bad gamblers like like really degenerate gamblers i mean there was one point i was 10 years old and they didn't pay it was very cold very very cold winters like in the 60s and um in new york and they didn't pay the oil bill or the heating bill and um we couldn't stay in the house because the house was too cold the oil burner broke so we had to get shipped out to a relative's house and i think they didn't pay the bill because they were gambling a lot she was too. They both were. And I guess that was their escape, like a form of addiction. And I remember um, when the person that I had to go to their house, my uncle, they had kids of their own and it was one of her brothers. And I remember hearing them when I was in the room sleep, like trying to go to sleep, um, that my aunt was saying to him, like, when is she going to take her out of here? I don't want to hear. Like, it was just a very hard, terrible feeling to feel that as you're getting thrown out of your house, you're not wanted in this house, you don't have a place anywhere. So there was a lot of fear instilled in me. And with that, there was a lot of anger, a lot of anger within me. You know, I was always fighting, like I was always lashing out. Um, so you know, the question also, did my parents care? My parents cared about who you were going to get to better them. Like if you got someone with money and most of the guys in the neighborhood were criminals. So if that was okay, that was just fine. Where for me as a parent, I, I wouldn't want my daughter with that. 
I wouldn't want my daughter with a person like that. But they liked it. And what's your family like now? Like you have your daughter and I saw on your Instagram, you have a son, you have a, you have a grandkid. Talk to us about your family life now. Oh God, I have a beautiful family. I raised my kids totally different than the way I was raised. Um, I have three sons, three adult sons. So my oldest, which uh, is 47. And then after that is 42. And then my son, Keith, which is my youngest, uh, is 34. And then Brittany, my do youngest daughter, because there's three boys and she's the youngest, she's 32. And she has two, I have two grandchildren, three and one and a half. And my daughter's pregnant again. So oh, congratulations. We're, congratulations. Thank you. We're all very, very close. We're a close knit family. My son lives, my youngest son lives out in LA. But he does, he just spent five weeks with me. He was home. And, you know, when he's here, we're out. We're out in restaurants. He was here for Thanksgiving. Um, and then the others live locally. So my kids, we're, we're, we're just a really close-knit, great family. They all have their own businesses. They're all very, you know, they have, they have education. They've all succeeded in life. So they're all doing well. Amazing. So sorry. Well, sorry. One last thing. It, yeah. Our audience is, they're going to ask, like, we need to know, are you married? Do you have a partner? No, I'm not married. I've been divorced for it's I'm separated 10 years and I'm divorced eight years. I've been away like, and I don't date or anything like that because I think I've gotten to a point in my life where, um, I'm so content and I'm so happy with my children, my grandchildren. And I just feel like I don't, I've had such a rough road with men with trust and I just don't feel like I have, I don't have a need for that. I'm very involved in my church. I, I am very, um, grounded. I'm a practicing Catholic. So, um, I have that. I have a couple of close female friends and I have my grandkids that I see every day. I'm very part of all of my kids lives. So, I have such a like good fulfilled life that I don't need it. I feel this, I feel like this is the happiest I've really ever been. Amazing. Amazing. Beautiful to hear. You're probably going to get blown up with a lot of requests from, from single guys now. So I, I've been getting that and I do get <laughs> that and I get it from younger men too. God, like I'm, I'm like, no, you know, it's just, I'm, I'm in a good place. I'm just really in a good place. You know, I've had several failed marriages and I just don't want to go down that road again. I think that the last marriage was, it was a nightmare because it was the father of my children. He was a street guy. And you know, that then I gave him a chance when he got out of prison, he still didn't change. And I think a lot of these personalities, not, I think, I don't want to say, I think I want to say, I know. I know a lot of these types of personality, which is the criminal street guy, the organized crime guy, the mafia guy, you know, whatever, how you want to talk or use the terminology, I think, I believe they don't change. They are who they are. They might say they're changed, but they're truly far and few change. So I'll give you an example why I say that is because change is hard. It's a lot of hard work. You, ha you have to really dig, dig deep down to be the person you are. Like I had to work really deep within myself in therapy for many years and on an ongoing basis. It's kind of like I call it emotional surgery. So you open yourself up and then you got to be mended back together again. And you have to understand you before you could act and change is hard. It's hard. It's a difficult thing to do, but it's growth. You grow and you grow in a different area. And I think that if they don't put the work into that, and most men, it's very difficult for men to even go into therapy to recognize, oh, there's something wrong with me. I have a problem. I have to, un it's very difficult for men to do that. So 
if they are not willing to work on themselves and they feel that they're okay and it's the woman or they blame the woman or they blame whatever, they're not going to change. They're just going to take that baggage into the next relationship and do the same thing, the same pattern. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, these types of personalities are um, macho, um, uh, the woman belongs in the kitchen. You know, they haven't developed that a woman has a voice, a woman can be independent, a woman can do exactly what you do. I think that they they have low self-esteem, but they're never going to admit that because people that go out and hurt other people are hurt themselves. Mm. They hurt people themselves. You cannot go commit a murder or do a heinous crime and feel good about yourself. As a human being, you can't. You're either a sociopath, a narcissist, a psychopath. Normal people don't do that. So when you can do stuff like that and have no conscience, how could you go have a good marriage or be a good father or be a good participant in your family? You can't because you're emotionless. And I've witnessed that firsthand. I've lived with that. So I think that even the way I am in coming into this podcast world in this particular genre, these men are bashing me. I'm taking the dots from everybody, you know, but I'm, I feel I'm not going anywhere and I'm going to pave the path for other women to come in and for other women to have a voice and for other women like me to speak up, speak out and speak the truth. And I'm Absolutely. not going to be shut down. I won't be shut down. And on that point, Andrea, so we talked about family. We talked about, you know, your upbringing uh, as, a, as a young lady. And I think a lot of people right now want to hear about, for those of you that don't know, by the way, Andrea was a part of the cast in the Netflix uh, show Get Gaudy. I think it was number one on Netflix. Um, I love the show. I really enjoyed it. Um, I think it was well made. A lot of people, like you just were just mentioning, a lot of people were heated. A lot of people were upset and pissed off because the show presented you as uh, somebody that was uh, an John associate. Gotti, John Gotti's trusted associate. Yes. So we want to unpack all this. A lot of people are dying to hear from you. A lot of ex-mob guys, ex-gang uh, guys that were in that life want to hear you know, about how you got into it, right? Because everyone wants to know, like, who is this person? Um, even though you're a published author, you've been in TV, I think, for uh, over 30 years. So you've, you've been around. People just really haven't really, um, you know, maybe heard about you as much as they have now because of the hit series on Netflix, which was amazing. So talk to us a little bit about how you got into that life. And let's, let's get into it. So, okay, I got into, um, I was asked actually to be in Get Gotti through uh, two of the producers um, had contacted me because they actually saw me in um, Gotti and Son on A&E with John Gotti Jr. They, mm -hmm. There was a series done. I was in that. I was also in on the Reels channel, um, Mafia Killers. I was in every episode of that. So when people say they haven't heard of me or haven't seen me, that's a little foreign to me because I've done so much of this stuff. But how I've gotten involved in it is that back in the 80s, I met, um, I was divorced for a second time to a legal businessman and I was about 28 years old. I started going out to a club in Manhattan and I meet Mark Ryder. Mark Ryder was a very close associate to John Gotti. He's actually still incarcerated as of this moment. So through Mark Ryder, I met John Gotti. Um, I was dating Mark Ryder, but when people say, how did she become friends with John Gotti? Now I didn't put in the Netflix series associate. They put that. I'm not the producer. I'm not the director. Like I said, 
they put associate, they should have said Gotti's friend because I was a friend of John Gotti. And I think that people got up in arms about when I would say we. When I said we, I was also arrested on a RICO charge. When I was arrested on a RICO charge back in uh, 92, I was arrested with 22 organized crime guys. What I was arrested for, and these are all facts and documentation on this, I had been a loan shock lending money out to drug dealers. When I was dating Mark Ryder, I was already in the streets. I knew the language. I knew these guys. I was raised into that. So I come from a family that was involved in that. So when my husband was incarcerated and he had a lot of money out on the streets, I was already lending money out on the streets. So when I met John Gotti, I was a street kid. You know, I knew the language. I was going out with Mark Ryder. But when I would sit with them as, as we'd go out, like every Tuesday and Thursday night, we would frequent the same places, a club called Club A and a club in Manhattan called Regines. And John liked me. And why John liked me is because John knew I knew the language. I knew the protocol. I knew if you hear something, you don't go say it. And he particularly liked me was because there was an incident that happened in a club one night. And then I got into a fist fight. Like I said to you, I was always very angry. I always had a lot of anger. And after that fight, John named me Rocky. People say that's not true. That's a lie. There were people there. Why would I lie about? Like, there's who, no who reason was there? to lie. Uh, no, can you tell ahead. us like who was there? Like, because uh, people are going to say this in the comment section. I can just imagine everyone that's you know going to watch this on YouTube. They're going to say who else was there to corroborate well, the story. Can guy, you drop there was any a, names? There was a guy there, Nunzia. Well, I'm going to tell you who was corroborating at this time. John Gotti was being watched. He was being, we were being filmed because this is at the time when he was being watched on everything. So there was FBI across the way. When I got arrested, it was brought up to me. That particular incident was brought up to me by the feds. So there was a guy called Nunzio. There was a guy called Bobby Waters, they used to call him because he used to drink scotch and water. And I believe it was Boriello was with him and myself. Mark Ryder was not there. Ali Shades was there which is a street guy. He's with, I believe, the Lucchese family. Allie was there and Margot was there, his girlfriend. I got into the confrontation because of Allie Shades' girlfriend. These two women were speaking about her and I defended her. So Allie Shades was in the downstairs bar with other guys. I can't, rem I, I don't remember who, but I know he was definitely there. So that story had been out in the streets for a long time. I don't know how people didn't know about it. Big Ange knew about it. You know, everybody knew about there was a fight in Club A because Mark Ryder got the call the next morning. Now, trust me, if I ask Mark Ryder and he calls me up and he says to me, uh, and I say, oh, they don't believe it. And I say, well, these two brothers, they said they want to speak to you and I give them your number. He would call you from prison and say, listen, it's true. Can we get that set up? That would be great content. That'd be awesome. <laughs> that would be great content. I'll give you, you have my number. Let's set that up. I have your up. number. And you know what? I might do that for you. Because, we appreciate that. Because, because Andrea, every, we're rooting for you. You know we're why? Because everybody, everybody wants to keep saying lying. You know what Mark Ryder said to me? Give me the number and let me call them. He already spoke with Cassie Thornton, which is the producer that did get Gotti. I put him on the phone with her. And he said, she is one of us. That's his words to her. She is one of us. She is not your normal girlfriend. This kid was raised in the streets. She's tougher than some of the guys that are out there. And that's exactly what John Gotti's quote was. She's got more balls than some of the guys that are around me on my grandkids' life. That's what that man said. So for these people... And, and, you know, I need to bring this up too. You know, I'm hearing now on my podcast, my attorney will be coming on, which worked very close with Bruce Cutler. Her name is Bettina Shine. She knew I knew John Gotti. 
she said to me, where they're coming up with this, I don't know. What I believe it is misogynists. Okay, so let's let's explore that a little bit uh a little bit deeper. So I was it was it Michael Francis? Was he the first one that that kind of publicly yeah. Oh Michael Francis, mm -hmm. yeah. First of all, Michael Francis started it. Yeah. Michael Francis started it, this whole big thing with all his followers and um I don't believe her. Uh, they were desperate. No, 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 no. Netflix was not desperate, first of all. I know they interviewed other people. I know the people they interviewed, and they happened to choose me because they did the research on me, and they felt it would open up a lot of doors, and they wanted me. So Michael did not know he was wrong. And another thing I need to bring out, Michael's from another family, a whole other family than the Gambino crime family. How does Michael know? what John Gotti was doing on his nights in New York when Michael wasn't there. Or how would Sammy know? They were not there. Sammy at the time was hanging out with Frankie DeChico in Brooklyn. Michael was nowhere, who knew where he was? So when I asked Mark Ryder that, Mark Ryder said, Michael wasn't even around us. He said, so you were probably around John Gotti more than Michael ever sat with him. So would you say that in, in the mafia world, would you say that this person, Mark, was the one who he, what do they call it? They, what was the question? Was, was he the, um, the guy that put you on, on record? record? If not, who was the person that put you on record? To be around these people? Or, or was, did that even happen? Like, is that even, that's a question that we wanted to ask. Was there someone who put you on record or didn't even need to go down that way? Like, did a captain come and say, this is, you know, so-and-so, she's with me now, a part of the crew? No, because before Mark Ryder, I was living with Frank Lino, which was a captain from the Bonanno family. So no, no, I'm not going to say so, Mark okay, Ryder. So People knew me because I had been living, when I was 22 years old, I was living with a captain for the Bonanno family. So on that point, though, so you're so, with so Frank. So that, that, the answer to your question was Frank Lino. Okay, okay so, awesome. So but, with Frank, like being part of the Bonanno family? Yes, he was. He was yeah, him. like if he's a part of the Bonanno family, I think people are going to ask this. Gonna he, say, was so a then, he wasn't just part. He was a captain, which he means was the he, captain. Had, he had like 500 guys under him. He was a boss. So if he was the captain of the Bonanno family, then how would you be a part of the Gambino uh, because crew I, or I family. Wasn't, I, wasn't a, I wasn't involved with them. I was his girlfriend living with him. So you do deny that you were, like when they say on the show on Get Gaudy with the little subheading, it says associate. Like, I do you agree with that. that or you disagree with it? No, 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 no. I'm not, no. I did not put associate. So when they put associate, no, I wasn't an associate where I, associate, you could be an associate by being a driver. You could be an associate by, you know, being a chef or his cook. But in, in that world, associate means you were like a maid person, like somebody that was doing illegal activity. No, 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 I was not. I was not anything to do with illegal activity. I was not anything to do with you know, their criminal life, anything like that. I was a friend, just a friend. Andrew, you want to know what I think personally? I think that you blew up with Get Gotti, okay? And <laughs> I, think, I think that some of these guys took it as an opportunity, and I think this should be taken as a compliment where they said, she's trending right now, she's viral, let me take some shots mm -hmm. at her. Because, 100%. because here's what I said. I defended you on an interview we did with someone else. And what I said, because I said, Andrea's not here to defend herself. I said, but two things that I'd like to point out. Number one, she got arrested in 92. I go, why would they arrest her if they didn't think that she was involved in some sort of manner or capacity? How could they ar just arrest her? And number two, I said, Anthony Ruggiano Jr., he's, he's a real guy. And he's obviously, he was on the show with her and he's been on her podcast. Why would he do that if there was no legitimacy? So those are the two points that I brought up personally. Thank I don't you. Know what you think. I don't know what you think about that, but that's I, what I, I said. I think that you're 
I think your perception is very good because also it's not that I was just arrested. I was arrested on a RICO, a a RICO, RICO. which is for organized crime. I was arrested with 22 men. I was arrested on the same charges that they were charged with. So you don't just get arrested for that. And what I was arrested for, there were wiretaps for giving instructions to hurt someone, to hurt a man called Joe Florenza. That's what I was arrested for. So when people, men, now I need to bring this out as you two men are sitting there. I was thinking about this the other night. Let's take Sammy Gravano. He's short. He's little. What is he? Five, six, five, five, whatever he is. But when he was younger, he was a small guy, small guy. He wasn't five. He wasn't six, five. He wasn't six, four. But yet Sammy, small guy, extremely treacherous. Okay. Here I am because I'm a woman. Because I'm a woman, 130 pounds, 5'5", five, five, that's what I am. That's what I was then, maybe 120 pounds. But because I'm a woman, you don't want to believe that I had that fight in me? That's basically where, where it's at. They feel because they're men and I'm a woman, I didn't have that tiger instinct in me. Yeah, like I have a question when it comes to the loan sharking, for example. I'm just trying to visually play it out in my head. And that's why I put, I know where you're going with that. When it comes to loan sharking, the guy didn't want to pay back. And I sent people up there to hurt him. And that's what I got arrested for. Got it. So you wouldn't obviously go in yourself physically to go and and, and, to collect, right? You would have people. I had had people behind me, backing me. Okay, got it. I had other men backing me. So, of course, but I'm saying because they look at me and say, okay, yeah, when I was younger, tiny little blonde, beautiful girl, she's like, I don't look like that, but I was a businesswoman. And when you're a businesswoman with these type of men, you have to be a treacherous businesswoman. You cannot let somebody take away or get away with having your money. I had $20,000 out on the street. This guy wasn't paying the money. The reason he wasn't paying the money is because the DEA told him to hold it. Don't pay how he was already working with the DEA. His name was Joe Florenza. We didn't know this. We didn't know our phones were being wiretapped. So I said it was month, two months. I says, wait a minute. This guy isn't paying. This is a while already. I said, go get uh, um, Freddie Puglisi, which just got out after 30 years. He was incarcerated on my case. Mike Spinelli, which is still in, these were the guys that were going to do the work. Go get them and get my fucking money back. That's what I said. I don't care if you break his fucking head. I don't care what you do, but get my money back. So that's what I was arrested for. So when they come back and say, she made these things up or she made these lies up, you got to be a mental case to make this up. How do you make something like this up when it's documented? So the only thing I think of, I think of, and you guys, two men, you come, your brother just said it. He said exactly what the producers, directors, and everybody from Netflix, the little genre of those men are throwing dots, but 196 countries around the world loved Andrea Giovino, loved her. That's why Netflix is I'm not I can't say too much right now, but I have a come, lot of nice things on. coming, a lot of big things coming. Okay, that's exciting. A little sneak, a little sneak peek for us. Uh, you'll be hearing a lot more of my story. Okay, that's exciting. Awesome. Okay, you'll be hearing I, a lot of it. So you know when you have them, you know Rolling Stones magazine putting up a big article and. People saying, who's the woman with the pink blazer? I stood out in the show. So your brother is 100% right. He picked up on it. They're jealous. Yeah, and I, I think that, like, we talked with, we sat down with Sammy. We sat down with John A. Light uh, in their home, in their studio. And, you John know. John A. Light knows me very well. Yeah, and, and you know, like, we asked them about their drama with, with each other, right? And. Mm-hmm. Is there any way we could fix it? Can we hop on a call? Can we just do something? And, you know, they, they've got their own reasons why that they have those issues with each other. Mm-hmm. But both of them, both of their stories check out, right? Like they're both 
real guys. And so what I'm trying to say is that there's, there's truth to your story. Obviously, you got arrested. The feds wouldn't just arrest somebody on a RICO charge. They dropped the charges, but the point is they arrested you. That wouldn't be the normal flow of that procedure by the feds uh, in right. any circumstances, right? In other circumstances. So I think that there's truth to the story, but sometimes on this online YouTube stuff, there's some drama and some beef that happens. And you know what? It gets more clicks. It gets more views. That's what a lot of people are, are asking. That's exactly right? what happens. Yeah. So I have a question on that point. So you have somebody like Michael Francis, right? Uh, everyone looks up to him in this world, in the, in the sense of the YouTube world, right? Uh, when it comes to the mafia stuff, he's doing really well for himself. Uh, we've interviewed him uh, multiple times before. Mm -hmm. Now, for those of you guys that don't know, uh, Michael Francis was reviewing Get Gotti. And um, he was pretty much saying that like he doesn't know you. Um, I wrote it down right here just, just so that I'm not paraphrasing. He pretty much says, like, where are you coming from, lady? Uh, first of all, she wasn't an associate of John Gotti. Let's get that clear, which you cleared up today. I did as well. clear up. Uh, right. And uh, John Guy didn't have women associates around him. She talked like she was one of John's crew, but she was just a girlfriend of a guy in John's crew. Um, I don't know where she came from. I've never heard of her before. I don't think anyone has heard of her before. Okay. Um, can, I, can I say this? Yes, yes. Go ahead. I think that's a lie right there. How could he Which say part? when he's friends with Gotti Jr., you mean to tell me you never watched Gotti and Son? I was in that. I was in that, Michael. I'd be curious to hear Michael's uh, response to that. Yeah. How, how could you say that you never heard of her? I've been in all these documentaries. How could you say I never heard it? Nothing. I've probably been doing more TV than he ever did. I was doing it way before him. You never heard of me? I don't believe that. And I don't believe this. I'm going to say this because, yeah. as I said to you when we first started, as someone that professes to be, I don't want to talk about him. I want to talk about me. I don't want to bash anybody. I think that when you are close to God and you're a good soul and you're a good person, you, he could have been a more of a gentleman. He could have called me up. He could have reached out and said, Hey, you know what? I never heard of you. I didn't hear. Can you tell me how you knew John? I would have very much like a lady spoke to him. But it's the way he went about it makes me believe what kind of, it's not the same God I follow because you're supposed to be kind, caring, loving, and even love your enemy. I don't want to talk about him, but I think that it could have been in a, because he does all of this, it could have been in a much nicer manner, not the way he bashed me. I, I will go on record to say that we do have an mm -hmm. interview dropping uh, very soon with. He, he could. I feel like he could have questioned me and I, you see, I, I'm open in a much more respectful manner to be respectful just as a lady, as as he's like, who's this lady? First of all, I'm a mom. I'm a grandmom. That's a degrading mark right there. You know, he could have been more respectful because he professes to be that that kind of tone that he took and you were just reading it, that comes from me more of a thug. You're a thug when you speak like that. And you've told me, you've told everyone you've changed, but that, that doesn't seem to me that that's changed because thugs talk like that. A gentleman wouldn't speak that way. Michael, if you're listening to this, we'd love to you know, hear your uh, response to that. We're very open to you know, hosting multiple people all at the same time. and talking talk more about this but uh you know i i have no problem i have a very strong sense of myself i have no nothing is going to intimidate me nothing's going to shut me down nothing's going to make me go away i'm going to speak the facts i'm going to speak the truth and i'm going to respect people and i will debate back and forth in a respectful manner but when you attack my character and he attacked my character that's not that's not a gentleman. I'm sorry. It's not. That's not. I want to, I want to ask you about the charges. So ultimately they were dropped. Like what happened? Walk us through what, that. My were charges were dropped. Um, 
Um, that's a good question. My charges were dropped and erased because I had four little kids at home. I was facing 10 years. I'm actually going to be having my attorney on my podcast to explain the charges and what happened. My husband at the time was incarcerated in Tennessee on an eight-year bid on a marijuana case, 100 pounds of marijuana. So when I got arrested and I was facing, you know, this time um, and with the RICO, you know, there was murders involved, cocaine involved, marijuana involved. I was being charged with everything everybody else was being charged with. And like I said, there are people on my case in September 9th, 1992, I was arrested that are still incarcerated. So my, when I got arrested, I stayed overnight. I got bailed out on a hundred thousand dollar bail. And when my husband called the next day, I said to him, John, you got to do something. I had nothing to do with murder. I said, you better come forward and tell the truth. And he was like, how am I going to do that? I'm incarcerated. I said, well, then you better call up the prosecutor and tell the prosecutor, which the prosecutor's name at the time, which you can go back and fact check. His name was Ross Pearlson. I said, you need to tell the truth. So with that, my brother, John Silvestri and John Fogarty cooperated to get me off the case. Because truthfully, the Fed said they really didn't want me. They knew I put money out. They wanted the ones that did the murders and all because the case was really snowballing into a bigger case. So with upon their co cooperation would mean I get released from the case and I don't have, it's expunged. I don't have the felony charge on me. And that's basically what happened. So what happened was I get released from the case. The Now I was indicted, but now all of a sudden, the defense attorneys for the other people see, oh God, her name is not in the indictment. She's off the indictment. What does that tell you? Let me see. I'm going to ask you the question. What does that say? They're going to assume that you snitched or you exactly. ratted. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So automatically when that happens, they're going to say, oh my God, she's off the indictment. But I never, ever cooperated. I never had to cooperate. They're facts will come out when my attorney comes on also, or I will speak about it now, is that when my brother and my husband cooperated, I get released from the case. Okay, I'm done. Now we go forward. I get relocated and I didn't want to go into witness protection because why would I go into witness protection? I never cooperated. Yeah. So DEA an FBI come to my attorney and say, there's a contract out on her life. So my attorney says, I want to hear the tapes, which she did. Mike Spinelli and his sister were conspiring and the sister went to jail for five years for that. They were conspiring to have me killed to stop John Fogarty and John Silvestri from cooperating. Okay. So with this, the feds come and say, okay, we know you don't want to go into witness protection, but you're going to have to be relocated because there's a contract out on your life. And we have to have the safety of your children. And if you don't go, you could lose custody of your children because you're putting them in harm's way. So I get relocated to Pennsylvania, about an hour and a half out from New York. With this, I never changed my name or anything like that because I didn't need to. As time goes on and the cases are coming up, now we have um, big name. Danny Marino, which was, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Okay. He was very, you could Google him, big part of the Gambino crime family. I. He might have been a captain, an underboss at one time when Gotti went away, but pretty high profile. And Joe Watts, go to my attorney and ask their attorney to go to my attorney to have me go testify with them against my husband at the time, which wasn't my legal husband. He was common law. We weren't legally married to say that he wasn't going to be a credible witness because he was on drugs. Okay. The prosecutor, Ross Pearlson, says 
he wants me to go on his side to talk about them. I say, I'm not talking about nobody. I'm done. Nobody. I'm taking a step back. All of you leave me the fuck alone. I want to raise my kids, be in peace. I'm done. So I never cooperated with them. I never went and helped them. And I never went and went with the U.S. attorneys. I felt at this point was my downfall, was my bottom, where I hit bottom to say the only loyalty I had were to my children. That's who I had to be there for. Those kids, nobody but them. I wasn't going with the men and I wasn't going with the prosecutors. I didn't want to put anybody in jail. I didn't want any of this to happen. I wanted to just get away from it all and to and to now come forward and let everyone know it is the most disgusting, ugly, horrible life. They're disgusting people and the things that they do and the corruption that they do and the way they cheat on their wives, the way they go out and abuse and murder and drugs and there's no moral compass at all. It took me all these years to develop to be the person I am. And I truly don't give a fuck what people say on the internet because like I said to you earlier, I have a beautiful life. I love my children. I love myself today. I don't need a man in my life, but I certainly am not going to shut my mouth either. I'm not that kind of woman to keep quiet and go in the, in the kitchen and go make some ravioli. I'm not doing that. I respect that. Definitely. I want to, I want to just quickly ask you, um, we ask a lot of these guys, you said something to me on the phone when we first chatted about you're getting on a lot of guests on your show who never ratted, never snitched, did their time. And I want to ask you what your thoughts are on snitching or on ratting. Cause different guys have different ideas about that um, or things to say. Okay. So I think that I don't, I think there's no loyalty in that world. So if someone is going to make a deal for themselves and they are going to face years in prison or life in prison, um, some people will never rat like Mark Ryder would never rat. I'm having, I had a guest on my show and it's going to be coming out next week. George Matarano is a real good friend of mine. He did 33 years straight. I asked him that, they, some people just won't rat, but I think that when you're facing and what they were giving back time years ago, like life and, and 30, that's your life, 30 years, that is considered life. So I'm not going to judge anyone that goes ahead and cooperates. I'm just not. I mean, if, if that's what they do, because it's a doggy dog world, you're in the streets and you're with a bunch of dogs, that's what's going to happen. Fair enough. Yep. Makes sense. We, we normally ask all of our guests, you know, um, that were in the life, you know, if they regretted it based off of what you told us before, it sounds like you definitely do, uh, regret, um, what you did yes, in that I, life. I, definitely. Yeah. But I think a lot of the guys, I think a lot of the guys love this stuff. If you watch them, they love to talk about the glory days. They love to talk about, oh, who they beat up or who they killed or who they whacked or what they did. It's it, glory. What? Yeah, you know, that's fair. You, there, there you, was a lot of people that we interviewed that actually don't regret it. And they've, they've told us flat I out, see, like they you enjoyed could see it. That. You could see that a lot of them just, you know, they talk about it like it's, you know, glorified. And, there, you know, when you speak the truth, people aren't going to like me. They're not going to like me. And I really don't care, to be perfectly honest. It's that I think that my reputation will even be get better by the guests I'm having on that are coming on my show that I'm interviewing somebody tomorrow that he did 30 years. I have a lineup of people that are coming to me that are getting out of prison that respect me, that really care about me, that are going to come on my show that, you know, they're going to tell their story. And I think people need to hear their story of why they didn't cooperate and why, you know, they did all this time and what it's like to do all this time and what they think about people that did cooperate. So I think everybody on YouTube, all of them, I don't know, I'm new to this, but it seems like all of them have been cooperating witnesses. They've all, you know, nobody has a podcast other than Joey Merlino, which is about sports. 
I want to I want to ask you um if you had the chance to go back in time, change one thing about your past or have a glimpse into your future, which one would you take? Um I regret in my past, I just regret like being in the streets and what it did to my children, like just the thought of being away from my children or losing my custody of my children. I, I just regret, I, I, I regret that whole time frame. Like, like worrying about, worrying about money. I don't worry about that today. I think I have such a good, strong sense of like, I turn fear to faith. I, I don't, I just have a lot of faith and I don't worry about, I know everything will be okay. Where when I was much younger, I always was worrying about like, you know, labels or jewelry or nice clothes or trying to prove something because I came from such poverty and had so much shame. I don't need to prove anything to anybody today. Awesome. And uh, another question I'd like to ask people, I think I know the answer to it, but I'll still ask. So if you had the opportunity to meet Adolf Hitler or Jesus Christ, who would oh, you meet and why? Of, por of course, Jesus Christ. Why? How come? Be because I love Jesus Christ because just by what I'm learning, you know, by being so dedicated to my faith that even, and this is a very hard one for me, very hard love your enemy, be kind, be kind, be kind. And sometimes it's hard to be kind when someone's hurting you. So that's something that I try to work on on a regular basis. That's why I had such an issue with Michael Francis, because he pretends to be that. But my, my religion shows me, Jesus Christ tells me, no, be kind. And there's no reason to hurt someone. You know, he he made a lot of people hate me. Well, maybe there's going to be an opportunity where uh, I don't know if you're open to it. You get on his show and and you you kind of do this with him and and maybe you guys fix it and, and grow together. Right. At this at the same time, because especially as Christians, right, like we're, we're Christian as well. So uh, I definitely agree with you in terms of um, maybe the way he went about it wasn't the greatest reflection on what well, you know, if, if he. If but. he were to admit that, just to admit that and say it, you know, that's why I wanted to respond to him, that he could have did it in a much more respectful manner. Call me up. Speak to me. You know, I'll talk to you. But it's the way he went about it. It was a th it was more like a thug. All right. Andrea, you have a podcast. Tell us about your podcast. Tell us about some of your goals for your podcast some exciting things coming down the pipeline okay. and obviously tell us what it's called. Okay. So my podcast is bringing to the forefront. I don't want, I don't judge anyone because I don't care if someone cooperated, they have to do what they have to do for themselves. Because like I said, I believe it's a doggy dog world. I know that nobody's there for you when you get arrested. So I've seen that firsthand. So if someone does that, that's fine. I'm not going to treat them any differently. And then I want to bring to the forefront the people that never did cooperate and what they went through and why they didn't cooperate. And I want to understand them. And then my long term goal for my podcast is mostly positivity. And what does that mean? It means to me bringing stories to the forefront of women more so women, I'll channel into that eventually, um, where they, and it doesn't matter what culture they come from. It, you know, it, it could be black, Hispanic, Asian. It doesn't matter that they're living in situations depending on the man to give them this lavish life. And I've learned firsthand when you depend on someone else, you're definitely going to be disappointed. You, you will be disappointed a hundred percent. You have to depend on yourself. So I want to bring stories of heartache, but then also redemption change, like people that really want to change. And I feel I started my journey with change through a lot of hard work with therapy. I always was involved with church. I was always practicing Catholic 
but not like I am today. Today, I, I actually just did, um, a thing at my church that they had. It was like four nights. You go like for two hours a night and a priest came down from Pittsburgh and you really work within, you work within yourself. You work within things that I'm struggling with as far as say anger, because I was raised to always lash out, hit back, hurt harder. Somebody hurts you, hurt them back. That's very hard for me. Like, so I'm trying to really work on that part of me to be kinder and better and just a, a better human being on every level to, if someone does something like answer back in a way that I don't want to hurt them. I just want to bring to the forefront. You could have did this in a better way. Love that. Love that. And we'll put the link in our description. Um, usually at the end of our interviews, Anjo, we started this new thing where we ask the guest, or actually we read to the guest a few negative YouTube comments, and we want to hear your response. Would that be okay? Would that be okay, okay with you? You've addressed pretty much all of this already. We just want to hear your, your initial reaction. We asked Sammy these, we, we read some negative uh, comments to Sammy during our interview. John Eli, we had a we had a good laugh with them. So I, I wanna I wanna just give you a few of them. There's a lot of positive ones, but we just picked out a few negative ones. So um one person said, nothing but a mafia groupie gave instructions, question mark. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I I somebody told me about that because I don't really read them, like I said. My daughter does all my stuff. And then I have a whole team that does my podcast editing and all that. But um, a groupie, how are you a groupie when you were arrested on a Rico? I mean, come on. Um, again, this, this brings up Michael. But sorry, Andrea, I'm with Michael on this. The <laughs> public, including me, don't believe Gotti even knew you existed, although we do believe you were involved in crime and you definitely snitched to save your booty. <laughs> <laughs> you got to love the YouTube audience. <laughs> Kevin, they said booty. <laughs> a lot, I have to say a lot of it, a lot of it is really, really funny. But I, I look at it like this. What kind of grown man goes on the computer and does this? <laughs> you got to love the YouTube comments. Some people are just, they I mind mean, it, me. it's crazy they're out there, but no, really all that stuff. Like I said, that, does, that stuff doesn't bother me. I'm not proving anything to anybody. I'm not here to prove anything to anybody. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So we got another one. Mob guys never allowed women or did business with them. Netflix shows are not accurate. So what would you have to say to that? I think that's crazy. I don't know where they came up with that because net, not Netflix themselves, but the production company really does a lot of research. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an idea. The person that I'm putting his show out uh, next week, George Moderano, that did 33 years in prison, he got interviewed by Netflix to be on the show. I actually recommended him because okay. he did two years in the cell with Gotti. He okay. heard about me first through Gotti in the cell because when they were both together, he said to me, when you're together 24 seven for two years that you talk about everything. He's actually a great guy. You should get on. He's got an amazing story. So, um, I think with that, it's more like, 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 where, like, where are you going with this? You're going to question, like, you think these companies want to be sued for, lack of information they go through a whole channel of like research on you i mean they really research back into they have these sites which i didn't know i i just learned recently where they go into the sites through like fbi and all of this to to get the documentation to find out they don't just go pull out of a hat and go oh yeah we want her i mean really come on you know like like that's just an ignorant statement it's just ignorant it makes sense because I'm assuming these guys are pouring millions into the production because it was such a well-produced show, in my opinion. So It was done, I'm going to say, so well. And I've done the other shows. I mean, you can go back and look at them. I think it was done so well in the way they did it and just the people that they had in it, you know, 
the people that actually brought John Gotti down, you know, when I was arrested, what was said to me, I was like, I don't know nothing and I don't want to talk to nobody. And they were like, oh, we backtracked you. You know everybody. So, you know, and, and Sammy knows me. I don't know how Sammy could say he don't know me. Oh, no. But then Sammy said, this is what Sammy said. Sammy said, um, I don't think she knows Gotti, but Gotti knew her. Okay, Sammy. So what is it? Did he know her or didn't he know her? Mm. I don't think she knows him, but he knew her. I mean, you tell me, what does that statement mean? Go back and look at that, what he said. Interesting. Okay. And then the last one um, that we got over here is, I don't really like Mikey, but I'm with him on this too. You said we a couple times and yeah, because I heard this in the interview too. I wanted to ask you because you did say we, right? In the, okay. In the and, I, and, I, and I know where you're going with that. We. Yeah. When I said we, we back in that time frame. Not we, it doesn't necessarily mean I was working with the Gambino family, the Bonanno family, mm. the Lucchese family. We, I was arrested in a case. We were getting away with a lot. Got it. Yeah, because that could definitely, I can understand both sides now that you've explained it. Because when I was watching it, I thought you were associating yourselves with them when you were using the word we. That's what it sounded like no, what, to be what, very transparent on my end as well, too. So right, I kinda... but what, what I meant back then, we, in that time frame, and then I explain in my podcast, we, meaning that time frame, you can get away with a lot because mm -hmm. of there wasn't the infiltration and the money spent like they have today. So we did get away with back then a lot. Does that mean when I say we, I meant to have nine guys of a crime family with me? No. <laughs> we, my little crew. We. Got it. We in general. That makes sense. We in general. But like I said, the people that were going to get my money back are incarcerated now. Mike Spinelli, he was made in prison, I heard. Freddie Puglisi, street guys. These were the people that were on my case. These were the people that were arrested with me. For sure. So, you know, I, you know what, you know what I think it is? I'm, I'm going to be honest with you from being around these people my entire life. I think that a lot of these men that aren't in the street that idolize people like Sammy or Michael Francis, they don't have the balls. They don't have the balls to be the man that these thinking these guys are a God going out and doing these things like hurting people or intimidating people or extorting people. That's not balls. To me, that's not balls. You're a fucking coward because you are taking from people like you are taking from, they used to shake down all store owners, hardworking people like payback. Well, we're going to hurt you payback sanitation department. So it's, it's not a matter of like, it's, it's putting fear into people and it's, it's no different than a gang. It's no different than the gangs today because a lot of times when they are one person and they go to prison, they have a hard time. They have a hard time because you don't have your gang with you. You don't have your knife with you. You don't have your gun with you. Yeah. So, you, want you know, and, 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 you know, you, you have these men that'll say, oh, because she was a woman. Because she was a woman. That's not true. Okay. You know, it's, it's just like anything else. When a woman tries to get, you know, years ago into the fire department, she had a hard time. When a first woman tries to be a police officer, when a woman tries to go and be in the army, they just, they're not accepting how it was. You know, I don't know how many times I can say that wasn't me that put associate. That was the production company put that, you know, that wasn't me. I never said I did illegal activity with John Gotti. Did I know John Gotti? Yes. Did John Gotti know me? Absolutely. Absolutely. Did I sit with John Gotti? A hundred percent. Did John Gotti give me the name Rocky? A thousand percent. So, you know, I'm. Not, that's it, you know. Well, like like I said, there's uh, there's a lot I, of evidence. I would like to know what. How does Michael know what he was doing? That's what I'd like to know. How does Michael know what John Gotti was doing on Tuesday and Thursday nights in Manhattan? Because he was never there. So, 
Well, and, there's, and, there's, and you know what? I'm going to ask Mark Ryder when he calls me if he could talk to you. Please. That'd We'd be appreciate great. that. Yeah, yeah, because he's going to tell you exactly that. How the F does he know what we were doing? He said, I don't even know him. And he was close to Gotti. You want to leave us with our audience with any last words, whatever those words are? I just want to have more positivity. I don't want negativity in my podcast. I don't want ugly. I don't want anything ugly. I want to live a good, clean Christian life and and walk the path of a good person. And I would love for um, everyone to tune into, you know, follow me on Instagram, tune into my podcast, Andrea Giudino One, you'll plug that in. But um, kindness, 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 kindness on every level. And, you know, you come at me, you come at me strong. I'm going to come back at you, but I'm not going to come back at you and go low. I'll come back at you and I will bring the facts to you. So, you know, the ugly can stop. Andrea Giovino, you've been so kind with your time. You're a star at the Netflix uh, hit series, Get Gaudy. Thanks. For those of you watching right now, make sure to like and subscribe. Click that notification bell for some new content coming out soon. You are awesome on this podcast. It was a pleasure speaking with you. If you guys haven't already, make sure to go and support Andrea. You are awesome. Thank you so much. They're going to hear so a much. lot more from me. A lot more. Lots coming out. <laughs> We're going to do part two in person if, if you'll have us. Yeah. Of course. Of course. Andrea, once again, thank you. Guys, until next time, we'll see you soon. We're out.